May I now request Sri Amit Ghosh, our staff member, for rendering the invocation. Professor Junchi Koizumi, Osaka University, Japan, and President of IUAEF. Professor Ajit Kumar Danda, former Director of Anthropological Survey of India, Government of India, and also former Research Director of the Asiatic Society. Professor Subhadra Channa, Professor of Anthropology, Delhi University and Vice President of IUAES. <laughs> Professor S.M. Patnaik, Professor of Anthropology, Delhi University, former Vice Chancellor Uttal University and Chair of the Congress of Delhi. Dr. Satya Bhattu Chakravarti, General Secretary, the Asiatic Society, Kolkata. <laughs> Professor Sujit Kumar Das, Treasurer, the Asiatic Society, Kolkata. <laughs> May I now request Shri Amit Ghosh, our staff member, for rendering the invocation.
Now, I would request Professor Vashude Barman, Vice President of the Asiatic Society, to felicitate Professor Junji Koizumi, President of IUAES. Professor Junji Koizumi, Professor Osaka University, Japan, and President of IUAES. Now I request Sir Professor Borman to felicitate Professor Ajit Kumar Dando. Professor Dando is former director, Anthropological Survey of India, Government of India, and we are happy to say that he was our research director, research director, former research director of the Asiatic Society. request Dr. Shatyabrata Chakraborty, General Secretary of the Asiatic Society, to felicitate Professor Shubhadra Channa. <laughs> Professor Channa, she is Professor of Anthropology, Delhi University, and Vice President of IUAES. Now, I would request Professor Shujit Kumar Dash, Treasurer, the Asiatic Society, Kolkata, to felicitate Professor Shomendra Mohan Patnaik. Professor Patnaik is Professor of Anthropology, Delhi University, and former Vice Chancellor, Utkal University, and Chair of the Congress of Delhi. Dr. S. B. Chakravarti, General Secretary, the Asiatic Society, Kolkata, will now deliver the welcome address. Zahur Bakhai, Masaul Khair, Dupar Bakhai, Good afternoon, Good afternoon to everybody. I started with Bengali followed by Sanskrit, Hindi, Persian, Arabic, Urdu, and English. Thank you. Thank you all to this historical hall named after Pandit Ishwar Chandra Vidyasagar, who was also deeply associated with Asiatic society long, long back. Professor Vasudev Borman, Vice President of the Society, Professor Swamiramhan Patnayak, the Chairperson in Session in Delhi of the 19th IA US, Professor, our Chairman of the Main Body, Professor Junji Koijovi, my colleague Dr. Sujit Kumar Dash, former principal of Alipur Government College, Kolkata, distinguished delegates from various institutes, various cities of the country, 
guests, friends, members of the council, members of the society, members of the staff, members of the media, friends. While I welcome you with a bit constraint in mind in the sense that the chosen debt that is today and tomorrow has been in the thick of things of the autumn festival. Though Durga Puja has ended, the rest of it follows today in the name of Carnival. I'm not sure by the time we end up here whether you will have occasion to have a glimpse of the procession taking about selected to the tune of hundred or some such number in the other side of the city, means outside this hall. We were apprehensive whether our delegates and distinguished participants could finally make it to reach the hall because of the apprehensive jam on the road. Thank God or Goddess Dugga, followed by all others with her, that with all blessings from all corners, it has been possible for us to be around. Thank you in advance for that. The next point that I want to make is, like me, I think each one of you in the hall, and especially those who have come from outside and those who are stepping into the hall or the precinct to the society for the first time in their life. As the Madam Nirika Madhotra was already expressing what a place, heritage and what not. Yes, it is. We have stepped into our 248th year of existence, glorious existence. It was founded way back in 1784 by no less a person than Sir William Jones, who was by profession a man of jurisprudence. By volition, he was a scholar, especially Indologist, but for whom and whose associates the whole world could not have known the treasure of knowledge of this country. India in, India in particular, Asia in general. It was his lifelong mission followed by some kind of an excitement <coughs> that followed during the Enlightenment in the West. There were two clear schools. The dominant school was whatever was good, better, best, everything originated in the West. But Sir William Jones, a Scottish born and with a few of his associates, a minority school, firmly believed that it is equally important to look for the treasure of knowledge, roots of excellence in all spheres of culture, science, arts, history, what not. And that is only available in Asia in general and India in particular. Therefore, that was the beginning of Asiatic society on 15th January 1784. And now it's a long journey, long history in my welcome address. I have no time to touch upon everything, but a brief outline in the sense that this is an autonomous body, a member-based society. Since it was declared as an institution of national importance during its bicentennial year in 1984, the government of India had taken over the responsibility of its financial backup. And that is how now we belong to the Ministry of Culture, Government of India, but the whole administration is run by an elected council, 20 members elected council and six nominated, four from Government of India, one from Government of West Bengal and one ex-officio president of the Employees Union. Asiatic society functions mainly on four props or four pillars, namely the museum, the library, the publication, and all of it, the glimpses you have already while coming into the hall, and please make it also a point to visit respectively 
the museum proper, the library, the publication houses. This will be available for you and that has been mentioned in the program as a heritage tool after tomorrow's valedictory session is over. This is in brief the outline. I would not go beyond this, otherwise we will be delayed. One or two more points. If you have noticed while climbing up through the stairs, there are quite a number of busts and photographs. One of that is Sir Ashutosh Mukhopadhyay, the founder, vice chancellor of Calcutta University, and also president of Asiatic Society twice, twice, followed by other members in Mukherjee's family later on. And it was he who ensured the beginning of anthropology in Calcutta University in 1920. It was he but for whom the whole discipline would not have come into the shape of this day, followed by the establishment of Anthropological Survey of India, which was established in 1945, and the founder director was Dr. B. S. Guha. And Dr. B. S. Guha was also the general secretary of the Asiatic Society in 1939 to 1942. What is called in Bengali Atos Lagha Mrittu Vat, but I cannot resist my impulse of mentioning it. That is, this poor fellow is the second anthropologist to have occupied the chair of General Secretary in the Asiatic Society since independence. And Professor Ajit K. Dondo, he represented India in very many world forums in the capacity either as Director of Anthropological Survey of India or Chairman of Inca or Representative Asiatic Society. And I have already mentioned that I feel terribly excited. I thought this is the last occasion, God forbidding, for him as well as for me to have attended any World Congress so far in future. He is close to 90, I am past 81. That is how I insisted, made a point that I should bring him with the help of Professor Shoman Patnayak. And so much so we thought that we will not only send a comfortable car, we would also send a medical practitioner if required. But thank God it was not required, but with some assistance, finally he could be back brought to the city and on the dais. So once big You must have also seen the bus of before I go into the room of Chomadu Koros right across. So let me first finish that Chomadu Koros was a Hungarian Tibetologist. Those were the days in Asiatic society where a lot many scholars, academicians, intellectuals had descended down on the precinct of the society in various capacities, mainly as a scholar. This was a scholar down to earth, terribly concerned for looking for the place of origin of his tribe, Magia. And he believed it, that they must be somewhere located in some parts of Central Asia. And from that long distant place, through Tibet, through various hazardous journey, terrific terrain, braved everything, finally landed into Asiatic society. And worked for some years as its librarian and worked Perhaps in that room in the corner, which has been now decorated with the help of the government of Hungary. He did a lot of work. While coming, he brought with him hundreds of Tibetan manuscripts. There was one more Italian, LP Tessitori. Similarly, came down to here, I mean, this place, got associated with the Asiatic Society, he did a marvelous job in the field of language. There are so many, I'm only mentioning one or two, 
finally, the theme of this seminar suggests that we must critically review the status and development of the discipline right from the beginning, passed through the colonial period and now post-colonial period. So this will be discussed over these two days in various sessions, individual lectures. I have not touched upon that, but for mentioning one thing, we know during our freedom struggle, even before, even after, how we have been treated by our masters, colonialists. Right across, there is a bust of Radhanath Shikdar, basically a mathematician, surveyor, and he was the first man to have measured Mount Everest. Finally, did not go with his name. Sir Everest got its name. I'm a little afraid, or should I say, a little apprehensive I'm mentioning it before some dignitaries or scholars from abroad, but they must also learn the truth of it. There was one archaeologist, Rakhal Dash Banerjee, the pioneer of excavation in Harupa Mahanjadaro. But it was finally not attached to his name, it was John Marshall. These are painful stories of the past. But this is the occasion to remember them since we are discussing not only anthropology. Anthropology is the beginning with A and also it is the beginning of all learning in a sense as I take pride in that subject. So we look into all the details as the founder president thought of the agenda while coming to this country while on ship he outlined his academic agenda that has become a mandate later on for us and we are pursuing with that. The entire geographical terrain of Asia would be the region for our activities, research, learning, etc. And broadly divided into three aspects, history, science, arts. If you kindly, some of you must have already gone through, he during his lifetime, he did not live long, only 48 years, and he was here as president for 10 years, or 11th year he died. He had delivered annual lecture every year and that has been published in the name of man and nature because it was his primary concern. He outlined the, the, the ambit of research in the sense that whatever is produced in nature and performed by man, whatever is produced in nature and performed by man would come under the purview of research and learning. What remains then under this sky? Therefore, we are still trying to carry out or carry along that mandate that has been given to us. Finally, why this is the mother institution including Anthropological Survey of India including Anthropology. All other, take name, Geological Survey of India, Archaeological Survey of India. Somewhere you find Alexander Cunningham, somewhere you find Thomas Oldham. So much so, the Indian National, uh, that is called INSA, Indian National Science Academy, was originated here. Indian National Science Congress began here in 1914, and Sarasutosh Mukherjee was the first general president. And during his time, many subjects have been added later on. Only among six main subjects, one was ethnology and the first sectional chairman was L.K. Anunta Krishna Ayar. So if you have chosen Asiatic Society finally to close your post-Congress as part of the main Congress, you have rightly done so. We have been honored to have hosted, to have got the opportunity of hosting this post-Congress in order to link up with our past heritage. Thank you, thank you very, very much. was a bias which entered then and is still continuing. And as we talk of transformation and continuity, 
we must realize that these are some of the elements that are so steeped into our policies, into our intellect, into our... Now we are talking of transformation, we have to take this transformation forward. We have to deconstruct... Coming of IUAES to India is a moment of internationalization of anthropology. Internationalization of anthropology in India doesn't mean that India never produced scholars of international repute or India never produced works of international reference. But the international current needed to seep down to the lowest level, to the level of every researcher, to the level of every scholar was much awaited. And when such a momentous occasion has come to India, it is time to acknowledge people who have contributed to it very significantly. I would attribute very directly to the historical work done by Professor Junji Koijumi and Professor Ajit Dando. 2004, they imagined a paradigm shift in building world anthropologists along with few other colleagues. And the outcome was WCA, World Council of Anthropological Associations. And that substituted the smaller national delegates which constituted adequate membership in the permanent council of IUAES. Now what change did it bring out? It brought out a change where different national associations were recognized. The national associations belonging to different nations, more so to the global south, they were recognized. And a parallel body came up, World Council of Anthropological Association, in addition to IUAES. And now, when we are celebrating this post-Congress here in the prestigious Asiatic Society premises, I am pleased to announce that both these bodies, IUAES and, and WCA, they are coming together. They have already come together under a rubric umbrella structure of World Anthropology Union. Now I am asked to speak on this World Congress. The scale, the extent, the magnitude, the depth, the coverage, the outreach, I think it is a historic occasion to record that three pre-congresses were held. One was organized by Professor Sukhan Chaudhary at Lucknow University. The other one was organized by Professor Deepshika Parnaval at IP University. The third one was organized at Indira Gandhi National Open University. And after the main congress, which was organized in Delhi, the two other post-congresses. One is being organized, today is also the date, by Professor B. V. Sarma at Hyderabad, and this is what we are all witness to. I consider it as my privilege to be a part of this historic occasion when Asiatic Society is organizing the 19th IUAES World Anthropology Union post-congress on a theme so central to the knowledge production. I remember Abraham Lincoln saying that if I have eight hours to cut the wood, I would spend six hours on sharpening the weapon. I think today we are primarily talking about the way knowledge is produced in India, outside India, and knowledge is produced in India, outside India, and in different parts of the world. The post-Congress brings us to a point of introspection. Introspection in the sense that India has been an oral culture. Documentation, writing down, text production, right from the Vedic time, has been something which has not occupied a central place. What had occupied a central place is 
continuity of an embodiment of knowledge the bearer of the knowledge the possessor of the knowledge like chanakya's famous couplet pustaka gata vidya parahasta gata dhana karya kal samuchyate nacha vidya nacha dhana if there is a learning which is documented in the book and if there is a money which is in others hand at the time of need neither knowledge nor the money is useful the person has to embody it the person has to possess it i am really so pleased and honored to be able to hear at the asiatic social society in kolkata and to be able to attend the inauguration of this seminar um, this seminar is a post post congress event of the 19 IUAS wow world anthropology congress 2023 in delhi as professor um, professor Patanaik Patanaik explained uh, the last world anthropology congress in india was held nearly half a century ago or in 1978 back in 2004 Uh, an IUAS Congress was also organized in this Kolkata together with Ranch. I have attended all IUAS Congresses held in the past two past uh, 20 years or de- uh, two decades. but i could not attend just one which is this kolkata 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 ranch congress i could not attend because of another um another official committee um at that time uh, probably i first met Uh, professor um that danda uh were well, around there to 2004 so uh, finally finally i was so glad to be here visit kolkata and visit this age Asia, Asia social, society. Now, in this month, in this month in Delhi, a splendid, as explained, uh, Professor um, Patrines, a splendid main congress. of the 19th and World Anthropology Congress has just been complete in Delhi with the greatest success. This was success was thanks for Professor Patnaik tremendous efforts and contributions to World Anthropology. Professor Patnaik has been IUES vice president since 2018 and he was elected as senior vice president of the International Union of Anthropological and Ethnological Societies at the main congress which has just took 
place in Delhi. Professor Patnaik will serve in this position of senior vice president for four coming years and he will going to make a, a lot more contributions to the world. Now this past Congress seminar, this one is titled The Roots of Indian Anthropology, Transition from the Colonial Opinion to the President. President. It is very significant to discuss on this topic here at the Asiatic Society, Society which has been a renowned, famous, historic center of Indian scholarship based on the historical colonial legacy and academic activities of the Indian schools. So many Indian scholars have been working in this area. Particularly, in, it's very in, interesting to know and discuss the intellectual activities and activities uh, products by the Indian scholars because we at IUAS WOW members gathered here from across the world and to address issues of global concern. I came from a small island, from Iowa, at the East, East Asian, East End of Asia, uh, which was virtually no colonial history at all. Professor Junji Kuesoni for the inaugural address. Professor Marman, my dear colleagues and friends, it's my pleasure to be here this evening, to be able to meet you all. And I am particularly thankful to Professor Sumendra Mohan Patnaik and Dr. Sattva Chakravarti has given me this opportunity to be here and to meet you all. And they have asked me to say a few words about anthropology, anthropological congress, anthropological and international congress. I was very much involved in anthropology. In fact, you can say that I was totally identified with this discipline. But, uh, I find that a sense of despair that prevails as if a disorderly condition is prevailing all over the world in the field of anthropology. We often do not ask why this sense of disorder? Uh, is anthropology as a science altogether expendable or it can serve humanity in some way or the other? Uh, my specific uh, response to this that anthropology by and large all over the world takes a pro-people stand and this pro-people stand makes anthropology vulnerable everywhere. But is this a crime to take a pro-people stand? Say, here I am an anthropologist, but I am also people somewhere. And everybody is people somewhere. So pro people, taking pro-people stand cannot be an offense. In one of the Science Congress meetings in Chandigarh, this question came up. 
that uh, how the softer sciences, so-called social sciences, is performing in comparison with the hardcore sciences like physics, chemistry, and other sciences. And as it transpired to the discussion, that the hardcore sciences is doing extraordinarily well by uh, discovering and bringing out new technologies, etc., etc. <laughs> I very casually told them, as you know, I am here as our president, Professor Sapun Kumar Pramanik is away. And I belong to a discipline which is far away from anthropology. Therefore, I do not venture to make any observation on anthropology, but as a general member of the public, I have got one or two observations. First thing is this, that as you all might be knowing, that the study of anthropology was initiated in this Asiatic society in the 19th century and onward. <clears throat> and the Anthropological Survey of India was also established by the initiative of the Asiatic Society. So this makes it quite relevant that the post-Congress sessions of the World Anthropology Congress 2023 is being held here. And for that, as a member of the society, I feel very proud of. Second thing, the theme, the roots of Indian anthropology, transition from the colonial period to the present. Though I am not a person of anthropology, I feel this is quite a good theme, and the roots will also be considering the status of anthropology at the present time. And during today's sessions and also tomorrow, I believe as the aspects of anthropology in general and social and cultural anthropology and physical anthropology in particular will be discussed during the deliberations and the speakers as well as the listeners will all be enriched. With this, I conclude my observation. Thank you. Thank you, sir. We are almost end of this inaugural session. Now, I would request Professor Shujit Kumar Dash, Treasurer. Before finally, before finally, Dr. Dash takes over for offering formal vote of thanks. Let me announce that during the main congress in Delhi, there were some lifetime achievements award were announced and some recipients, those who were present, got it there. But Professor Ajit Kumar Dondo could not make it to be present in Delhi, so was Professor Ranjana Ray. So the chairman requested me to use this occasion to hand over that award to them. Therefore, I request Professor Shoman Patnaik to come over and announce it. Chakravarti for giving us two minutes. As a token of recognition to our, the builders of the discipline. Uh, in uh, Delhi, we felicitated few anthropologists for their lifetime contribution to the discipline. And two of the distinguished scholars could not come in person to receive it 
unfortunately they are here among us so i would take the opportunity to announce <coughs> that uh, iuas world anthropology congress honors professor ajit dondo for his lifetime contribution and i request professor junji koichumi to felicitate him with the citation and also with the angavastra we have we have another distinguished anthropologist i stand corrected i have used a different term for her and uh, professor ranjana re professor of anthropology with uh, specialization in prehistory uh, for her lifetime contribution to anthropology and i request our senior vice president professor subhadra channa to felicitate ranjana di with uh, angavastra and the citation our general secretary dr shatyabrata chakraborty to felicitate professor fanandej is chair of council of commission iuaes and professor b v sharma director anthropological survey of india government of india kolkata so professor fernandez please this visit in india professor shumendra patnaik and also professor Miriam Grassi who introduced me to world anthropologies uh, in this lecture 
I'll try to provide some localized insights on the transition from the col colonial period to the present uh, from, uh, in a lecture entitled Post-Colonialism and Brazilian Anthropology. In the early 1990s, post-colonial theories held important relevance for Brazilian anthropology. During a pivotal moment of debates regarding the researchers' subjectivity in fieldwork and in conjunction with feminist theories advocating increased ref reflexivity and positional awareness, post-colonial studies produced by South Asian researchers in the global north played a substantial role in shaping anthropological knowledge in Brazil. These influences challenged established paradigms and encouraged the Brazilian academic community to reconsider their approaches, emphasizing the importance of the self-critique and the consideration of marginalized voices in research. This marked the beginning of a fundamental dialogue between Brazilian anthropology and post-colonial currents laying the groundwork for discussions on race, gender, and traditional communities, which I'll address in this lecture, among other subjects and fields. The impact of decolonial theories, which began to gain preeminence in the mid-90s, was profoundly significant in Brazilian context. These theories, produced by Latin Americans, also operating in the global north, brought forth the concept of decoloniality, which has become widely used in contemporary anthropological and post-colonial debates in Brazil. Additionally, the relevance of the category of counter-coloniality uh, created by uh, Negu Bispo, developed by the Quilombola movement and embraced by indigenous peoples is noteworthy. This perspective points out that it's not just about decolonizing, but actively resisting colonization, particularly in communities that have faced genocide imposed by European invasion for over 500 years. These concepts have played a crucial role in reshaping post-colonial discussions in Brazilian anthropology and tipping the understandings of complex colonial dynamics and resistance systems in Brazil. I will now address this debate through three concrete examples. The studies on racial hierarchies, feminist-based gender studies, and the recent emergence of indigenous anthropologists in Brazil. In the context of racial dynamics in Brazil during the colonial period, it is essential to examine the historical underpinnings that have shaped the country's racial landscape. Brazil, Brazil's colonial history was marked by discourses that differentiated racialized groups, ethnic groups, including indigenous populations and African enslaved people. This intricate interplay of classifications laid foundation for complex racial categorizations and hierarchies that continue to influence Brazilian society today. The influence of racial studies in anthropology has been profound. Notably, one study by Horacio Nogueira in the 50s made a comparative analysis between Brazil and the United States concerning racism. Anyway, I would be making closing remarks now. <laughs> not really opening. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, I should express my uh, deep respects to all the senior teachers who are here, my well wishes. <clears throat> I feel very honored to be part of this particular post congress and I'm fortunate to be part of Kolkata now as uh, you know associated with Anthropological Survey of India. Well, I'm also part of both the post-congresses we organized as part of this World Anthropology Congress. <coughs> uh, probably in Hyderabad, when they talked about post-congress, they talked about the roots, and the roots were in B.V. Sharma. I was not there. <coughs> and here, we are talking about the roots 
and uh, the title of uh, i mean the theme of this post congress is if i have uh, this is a roots of indian anthropology transition from the colonial period to the present i'm sure this post congress is uh, more concerned about roots and hyderabad post congress is mostly about the recent in terms of digital cultures <coughs> i think that is the difference and of course the other difference could be the averages of the uh, participants maybe in hyderabad it is 20 plus here it is 60 plus that could be the difference which also speaks about the roots and the present well i don't want to make my <coughs> concluding remarks also very uh, elaborate speech <coughs> uh try just say a few things some comments that i have about uh, the theme of this post congress i think uh, the theme being uh, transition from colonial period to the present we were trying to search how indian anthropology or anthropology as it was researched taught uh, and the research areas which have been prioritized etc you know these are the subjects perhaps and there probably we are talking about who has influenced for the transitions how this influence was made and what are the intents of this uh, influence in law well i think going to the roots we are trying to know generally the intellectual climates which have prevailed at time at that particular time and how the intellectual climate has actually affected the research priorities or the uh, whole research process and everything <clears throat> well as we do this exercise uh, there is ample scope for interpreting or reinterpreting the writings of the uh, early scholars of that time and also to understand better or uh, reinterpret the same ideas which have been floated uh, at that particular point of time and also in the process to identify uh, the real heroes uh, you know who have contributed to the indian anthropology i am glad that this is being done <coughs> here and very carefully uh, i mean it's very important to understand the roots understand the history and uh, understand the present uh, in the you know referring to this kind of uh, history of the discipline particularly in the indian context well uh, i will not really spend more time because i know that there is another session round table it's not correct to eat away the time of others <coughs> but i am glad that i have chaired this particular session relating to brazilian anthropology and uh, the points which were made by my good uh, friend now i would say <laughs> is actually how the subjects of research have shifted <clears throat> uh, you know post colonial period how race racism gender and issues like pluralism and ethnic identities and etc have become more important in this period uh, definitely this is the uh, uh, you know subjects which uh, you know research everywhere post colonial time i would say nations were talking about the cultural richness of each of these countries which have been liberated and we are also talking about the national identities <coughs> and how we can project that identity in different ways and all i'm glad to know uh, about brazilian anthropology the way it 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 uh, got shaped post colonial period and i thank organizers for giving this opportunity to me to chair thank you all thank you sir thank you very much uh now now the round table so i request professor budhadeep choudhury to chair the round table professor budhadeep choudhury please 
डॉक्टर शुभ्र शंकर बारिक डॉक्टर देवाशीष कुमार मंडल प्लीज कम ऑन द डैस With the kind permission of the chair, let me share the dais for issuing a note of caution. As you know, we are in the midst of leftover festival events. One is still on the other side, and tomorrow is Lakshmi Puja, which is household worship almost for all of us. That's why we have made it. Half day tomorrow, but not even full day this evening. So we have to cut it short somewhere. Otherwise, there will be problems for the delegates and participants to reach back their home. As it happens, the schedule is shown for 5 to 5:30. What is the time this has gone on? Huh? My God, 4:52, 4:52. Man, close to be concluded. I thought it was the last minute. We will extend it. We will extend it maximum half an hour, six o'clock. So let us say now, if it is, uh, we begin at five. Let us say five. So we have one hour. Chairman must be. Little ruthless, unlike the chairman. Otherwise, uh, 
and allotment of time should be as such. And for the speakers, this is anthropology and then round table. And there is a theme. Let us stick to the theme as close as is possible. And let us not repeat things. Round table has a special purpose. You address the whole thing in different perspectives. If you see that your point has already been made, there is absolutely no point to repeat it. That is the real mechanism of shortening the time and making the event on schedule. So with this, I apologize for this, issuing this note, but for the physical constraint that the city is undergoing right at the moment. Thank you. Thank you. I'm really happy to be here again. Uh, this is a great occasion. Um, first is post congress seminar in Calcutta. And this is a, a round table on post colonial astrology in India. Now, the time is very short. And as the moderator of the session, as the chair of the session, it is a very difficult task how to manage. The six speakers, give them only one hour. The total time is available is one hour. I won't take much time, just I would like to say one or two issues here. And of course I am not suggesting that we should confine only to that. You see, one is, uh, it reminds me about a document that was found I'm of course I'm speaking not about colonial period, post-colonial period, it is pre-colonial period. One document that was found while conducting the Peoples of India study, a, one instruction was given that has been found, but obviously for obvious reason, administrative reason, it was not discussed that much. That while selecting people, for that measurement, you see the high caste people when they will be selected, it should be fair complexion, tall, and for the other communities, for the indigenous communities, they can be black, they should be dwarf and or short heighted and all that. So I, did, I mean, what I want to point out is the idea is very clear before the British rulers, for the British rulers, that not to project that the people are different physically, they are also different culturally or so far as the community background is concerned. This was of course challenged by a number of nationalist scholar anthropologists because the same problem we have seen in other spheres of activities also. In, for example, now I am coming to the forest situation. Uh, are we still following the colonial approach of forest policy? Or we have really shifted from that? This is a major issue, major question, because now one will find gradual Increasing rather, increasing interest on uh, natural resource exploitation. Now, this is because of the fact that resources are mostly confined in those areas. Anywhere you go in India, the natural resources, forest, mineral resources, water resources, these are mostly confined in the people who are. La largely, largely the indigenous communities live. So, whether there is any reverse of the policy or reverse of the attitude of the administrators, this is to be examined critically and I think it is the responsibility of the anthropologists to critically examine it, analyze it and focus it to provide the correct approach in this regard. Now, without any further 
taking any further time because the, uh, we have very short time at our disposal. I would like to request the speakers and our Professor Rajendra Rai who has gave me this list. He has suggested that there is one mistake it has been done that the, the number seven is Dr. Devashish Mondal is from prehistory section. So he, she suggested that prehistory should come first. Anyway, I think that can be done. Prehistory may come if you all agree. We can start with prehistory. For taking one minute, uh, and I today I talk about the uh, uh, development uh, and changes of study and approaches of prehistoric archaeology in Indian context. And uh, uh, first of all, uh, the base was laid down during the colonial period in India, and uh, the. Uh, and the British occupants in India necessitated survey of the land and its people uh, and its people subjugated by the colonial power. In India, credit for picking up the first piece stone implements goes back to Robert Bruceford, uh, who was a geologist and he discovered the first stone tools from Pallavaram in 1863. Besides this, he discovered 459 historic sites in different parts from the different parts of India and earlier discoveries by Valentine Ball and Captain Beeching were, uh, were reported at first reported in the Asiatic Society of Bengal in the proceedings of the Asiatic Society of Bengal uh, in between 1865 to 1868 and then the Department of Anthropology started in 1920 and prehistory became an important part of this uh, the subject and uh, remembering uh, and the uh, many scholars took up the study of prehistory uh, the mention may be made by Panchanan Mikto, Ishita, Shukto, Kamite and also the uh, uh, scholars from the abroad also contributed a lot for the uh, development of prehistoric archaeology in Indian context and A.C. Chakladar uh, who became the head of the department in, uh, when the department was established in 1920 and uh, he also uh, contributed his lot in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the prehistoric archaeology and later he became a curator of the Indian Museum and classified the collection of uh, prehistoric objects in the museum. And then Ponchanan Mitra uh, was a renowned anthropologist and uh, he published a book on the prehistoric uh, India in 1923. Then the interdisciplinary approach of prehistory started and uh, the, uh, there are some scholars from abroad also from India made uh, some uh, path breaking studies uh, by F. E. Joyner from Oxford University uh, work joint together with the Archaeological Survey of India and Deccan College Postgraduate Institute Pune carried out studies on prehistoric archaeology in the background of paleoclimate and geochronology and then Dharani Shen uh, who <coughs> was a trained geologist as well as the anthropologist and he uh, took part in the Cambridge expedition in 1935 and uh, he also conducted field work in Sisha Valley in Northwest India, Normanda Valley and Mirjapur district and then we started I mean there are in a way there are four major strengths. One is the strength as a field work. Field work. All of us know that field work is so important and a lengthy field work. In the Malusian sense, one annual cycle, that kind of field work, which has been the strength, those who have experienced that, they have done a good job in terms of producing monographs and ethnographies. Okay. I will not name them, but I have listed a few. Then, different patterns of ethnographies have been seen in the Indian context. And why this? Because of a multiplicity of communities found in India. There is no dearth of communities found in India. And third is various discourses. Various discourses is what we started with trial class continuum, both ethnic and sociologists. 
into method of tribal adjustment. This is another trend by NK Moore. Then uh, the concept of post primitive tribe by P.K. Rajana. Uh, the debate of Varna Jati by Naris by Srinivas. Srinivas is an anthropologist. Okay. Then initially we started with the tribal policies isolation, assimilation, and integration. The debate started and the debate continues even today. The point of integration. Okay. These kind of uh, discourses have been going on in Indian anthropology. Then the last point is theoretical interpretations. I said four trends. One is strength as a field worker, second is ethnographies, third is various discourses which have been developed, and fourth one is theoretical interpretations. There lies the major issue. What is that? We have all followed the colonial theories. Had you have got any post colonial theory, even if you have got some post colonial theory, you begin from the evolutionary approach, then diffusionistic, then structure functional. Structure functional dominated. If suddenly we come to the picture, that is all structure functional, whether it is Srinivas or Dubey or even partly Andre Vente and uh, uh, most of the anthropologists, they all followed. Uh, beginning from uh, T.L. Madan, then M.G. Bailey, then Adrian Mayer, Becky Marriott, David Mendelbaum. All of them have done good work, but that is all based on structural functional or structuralist approach. Hardly you have found anyone following Levis Strauss uh, structural structuralism. They have not followed, except this side, Tarak Chitratas. He has done it uh, sometimes in the 50s. But otherwise, people have not followed the uh, structuralism of Levi Strauss. Northeast. Northeast, yes, Northeast, North yes. So, uh, initially, the first kind of ethnography all of us know that is by um, S.C. Roy, Arun Krishnaya, Varian Elvin, WHI Rivers, and Radcliffe Brown, whatever they have done. But this is all colonial influence, colonial anthropologists. Then, now, what is the point? that we have been discussing sometime back in 2021 Hyderabad University conducted a Yuka there they had a, uh, the broad topic was decolonizing the concept of tribe then subsequently many you know, seminars uh, and uh, many people including Virginia Staka and Felix Petal they all wrote about it decolonizing the concept of tribe what is that? we began with even now also if you see what is a scheduled tribe? The president declares a community as a scheduled tribe. That's all. What is the criteria? The criteria has been taken from local committee report of long back 1959. And what local committee said is of no relevance today. What it is said? Sign is a contact. What is this? This is not a criteria. This is the era of globalization and we are into communication system, IT sector, mobile phones, email, you know, Wi-Fi and everything. No, no village is unconnected through a mobile. Every village has a mobile phone. So now, you, this criteria is superfluous. Sign is a contact. But for that matter, sign is a contact. Why only try? It can be found among other communities as well. So it is no criteria. And then uh, primitive traits. I don't think there is something called a primitive trait. Uh, the government of India also removed this word primitive from its PTG. Now it's PTG. Most uh, vulnerable tribal group. So the point is, this primitive trait concept is gone. Third is distinctiveness of culture. What is distinction? Distinctiveness of culture. We are all part of a culturation. We tend to learn from others. If I learn, some English custom, if I learn some Kasi custom, if I learn some Bagari custom, being an Odia, if I learn some Lagno custom, there is no problem. So why a tribal can, cannot uh, learn all this custom? What is distinctiveness of culture here? What is that? How, how to make it a criteria? These are colonial you know, ideas. Now, another one is economically backward. Well, we agree economically backward, but in India, today under the Food Security Act, 81.6 crore people are getting food, free food. 
are they not economically backward? Why are they tribes? So why economically backward things should be, be a criteria? To the organizers, especially Professor Chakravarti for inviting me to be part of this community and thank you Chairperson for giving me this uh, brief uh, you know, uh, time for this brief intervention. So I am going to uh, mainly talk about uh, anthropology of gender as it has emerged in largely in terms of what I see in North India, anthropology as uh, practiced in North India. Uh, so I'm not really making a generalization, but you know, uh, based on my experience of over 30 years, that I'm, I'm looking at how anthropology of gender has uh, emerged and uh, you know evolved. Uh, so as all of us know that in 50s and 60s, Iravati Karve's work was one of the uh, you know key uh, uh, beginnings of a kind of proto-feminist anthropology in India and uh, it is only in 70s, 1970s that we see uh, an interest in women and gender studies emerging and this is, uh, this is uh, primarily linked to the emergence of women's movements in the Indian context and uh, in terms of IUA's contribution in, uh, in uh, you know, uh, kind of facilitating um, uh, Anthropological studies on gender, Leela Dubey, Professor Leela Dubey, who was one of the pioneers, she organized a panel in 1978 uh, conference, and which actually led to uh, the making of two uh, very important volumes on uh, gender. And she was the one who actually was also part of the Towards Equality report, uh, funded by Indian Council for Social Science Research. And she, along with other anthropologists and sociologists uh, from uh, especially Delhi, uh, and I can name some of them, Rashi Pandiwala, Kamala Ganesh from Bombay, uh, you have uh, Patricia Roy, uh, and many others later who actually was working on, uh, were working on uh, anthropology of gender. And uh, they, uh, they created a kind of niche in, within the departments of anthropology where uh, one could not talk about women and gender till 80s. When I uh, took up a study on women in 19, uh, mid 1980s, uh, I was not really, you know, it was really not encouraged by the department. Uh, so, uh, what one has observed over time that uh, number of women scholars have definitely increased, large number of them are there, but they are still not as visible uh, in terms of faculty positions, in terms of, you know, uh, people getting uh, uh, positions outside of academic, uh, you know, uh, uh, domain. Uh, secondly, uh, the nature of the composition of classrooms has uh, uh, changed uh, a, a, a lot. We have, uh, owing to uh, reservation policy, we have more people coming from uh, scheduled castes, scheduled tribes, now OBCs, and also you know uh, uh, other uh, marginalized uh, communities. And that has actually made a lot of difference. And in 1990s. What we have seen with the emergence of Dalit movements in India, that is the uh, movements of the, um, the so-called lower caste, that the emphasis on caste and gender has emerged as a very, very important uh, you know, area. And especially uh, women coming from the so-called scheduled caste have started to write about their narratives, autoethnographies, uh, uh, about uh, you know, uh, their life experiences. And we also have life experience writings uh, by so-called tribal or indigenous women from Central India as well as Northeast India. So they, uh, you know, in terms of anthropological community, I think the participation of people from the marginal communities, especially women, I would say, because uh, if you look at women also as a marginal group, and on top of it, that if they are coming from indigenous communities or from other, you know, uh, backward, so-called backward, socially and economically backward communities, you know, that makes a lot of difference. What has uh, really changed uh, in terms of uh, themes 
that are being discussed more in uh, in feminist anthropology or anthropology or gender uh, today in Indian context is that there is a re uh, re look at family and household studies. Uh, family and household, which uh, became almost a dated kind of topics in anthropology for uh, in in uh, right from 60s onwards. Now there is a interest in family studies from a inequality perspective, from the perspective of power dynamics between the you know genders. So the focus on violence, violence against women, is something that uh, that has emerged very very sharply, especially in the 90s. The other interest that I see uh, uh, from a socialist feminist perspective is that how the neoliberal policies are impacting the households and families and how it, these are also creating uh, you know, psychosocial stress on women of different generations. Uh, so one of the uh, ways in which I see a lot of young women coming from backward communities are interested in actually researching on aspirations of women in, uh, in uh, the urban context. So there is a lot of emphasis I see of women working in the urban areas, uh, not really going to the tribal areas as conventionally it was, you know, uh, uh, thought about because safety and security of the women field workers is one of the major concerns which uh, people did not really write about much earlier. Uh, the other thing I feel that, you know, uh, is uh, in terms of themes is the intersectionality of race if we talk about, say, violence against women from Northeast in North India. So the question of race and gender has emerged very importantly. Caste and gender I have already mentioned. There are also ethnographies uh, coming out on uh, women from the minority communities, especially, say, Muslims. So Muslim women, Muslim women's access to education, to healthcare, to some of these developmental you know, initiatives is something that is also being researched. Uh, the secondly, uh, the very important aspect of disability, disability as non-normativity, uh, non-normativity in terms of sexuality or in terms of non-normative bodies or non-normative, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, ways of living, uh, that is alternative ways of living is something that students are really interested in working. Uh, LGBTQ issues, queer issues is something uh, that uh, uh, the students are really interested in working on. So I think anthropology of gender has, uh, has taken a long, uh, you know, uh, journey in last 40 years or so, I would say. But it is one of the most productive fields in uh, uh, within uh, Indian anthropology, and I, I I I wish that you know we also take back some of the lessons that some of these researchers are uh, you know giving out uh, since uh, the leadership of anthropology still uh, continues to remain with men. So thank you. I would like to take your attention uh, to the manner in which the British uh, conducted the studies uh, of the Indian society at that point of time when they were ruling over India and how their perception has impacted the position of the tribal communities in the present context. And I, like, I would like to take your attention uh, to the category of criminal tribes created by the British during the British period, where uh, they kind of applied the positivist theory of Lombroso to brand uh, certain nomadic and semi-nomadic tribes as criminal tribes and they subjected them to various atrocious acts like uh, they were subjected to the Criminal Tribes Act where uh, the, uh, the tribes which were categorized as criminal tribes, they were forced to live in uh, criminal tribe settlements, they were, uh, they had uh, restricted uh, freedom, they did not have freedom to uh, leave their uh, settlement areas and you know, they were supposed to uh, report at the police station every day, you know. So here was a case where certain nomadic and semi-nomadic tribes, which the British found 
difficult to control because many of them also participated in the revolt movements uh, during the British period. They, these particular nomadic and semi-nomadic communities were penalized uh, by the British during the British period. When India and uh, you know uh, we can say that the perception of the British of understanding the Indian society was very very narrow because uh, when they talked about the Indian society they kind of mixed up the concepts of uh, caste and tribe. Many times they were treating the two concepts as, as if you know they are the same. Obviously we know uh, today in the present context uh, in the ground reality the uh, caste tribe continuum does exist. But before we go into the ground reality I think it is very important to clearly understand uh, the concepts you know of uh, caste and tribe. So when we talk about the British perception, uh, perception towards the criminal tribes, you know, we can also watch the impact that this uh, you know, policy of uh, the British colonial government has had in the present context. The criminal tribes, uh, when India became independent, the criminal tribes were denotified. And we know them as uh, denotified tribes in the present context. Uh, I would say that a uh, lot of anthropological works have been done in context of uh, tribes in the post-colonial period which have uh, given a clearer perception of what are tribes. Uh, we can say like, uh, you know, I know of work of Professor Khaka, Professor Vikke Shivastav uh, who were uh, uh, very important in uh, giving a clear definition of tribe. There were, uh, you know, and apart from that, there are a lot of works. Uh, uh, some some works have been done on the denotified tribes in the present context, and they try to uh, give a clearer perception of uh, what is the status of the denotified uh, denotified tribes in the uh, present context. And this is very important because the denotified tribes uh, have a, a special, uh, a typical situation where uh, they are still being stigmatized and they are still being treated as criminals uh, uh, by the administration. So uh, there are certain important works which have been done in the area of anthropology and I would say that not only the anthropologists, the sociologists have also contributed in the study of these denotified tribes. For example, I would refer uh, to the work of Anuja Agarwal on the Bedia tribe, uh, the works of uh, Meena Radha Krishna and there are many other works which have been done on the denotified tribes which give us a clearer picture about uh, the issues that are being faced uh, by the denotified tribes. Even in the present context I would say uh, you know there are many uh, communities within this category of denotified tribes which have not been studied, they have not been profiled. For example, one of my research scholars right now is working on the ear cleaning community who are called the Khan Maria. Now, uh, when she wants to go to the, the works which have been done on the Khan Maria, there is uh, not much reference to this work. So it is like, you know, one is doing an original work. So I would say that the anthropologists have contributed such a, to such a great degree in, uh, you know, giving clarification to the concepts uh, like tribe and service mentioning about uh, PVTGs, particularly vulnerable uh, tribal groups. All these concepts of PVTGs and DMTs have come because of the special contribution that has been made by the anthropologists to, uh, you know, study the tribes in the present context. So, uh, my submission is that in the post-colonial period, the manner in which uh, the anthropologists and sociologists have been taking up, uh, taking up the studies of uh, tribal communities, they should be taken up in a deeper perspective and we should try to, uh, you know, do more uh, kind of ethnographic profiling of many of the tribal communities which have not been studied and we need to look into uh, the particular uh, problems that these uh, tribal communities face in the various contexts and try to uh, connect our studies, uh, uh, our, contribu our contributions with respect to the policies that are being laid down. Because uh, 
no, I can say how the anthropologists have played an important role in the study of the notified tribes. Uh, you know, there are many anthropologists who were there in the National Commission for Nomadic, Semi-Nomadic and Denotified Tribes, uh, uh, Professor Shiva Bisad, Professor Vikke Shivastav and other eminent people uh, with anthropological background were there in these uh, commissions and they have uh, given uh, good relevant recommendations, uh, you know, after the deliberations that they had in the commission. So, the anthropologists have been making a mark in terms of the studies of the denotified tribes. I would say that uh, these studies uh, should be taken more seriously and uh, we should be able to arrive at certain important policy making, uh, you know, uh, recommendations that can help uh, the, these tribal communities to come out of their homes. Now, this is the time I will change the topic. I will tell you a different story. That is, uh, thank you very much to the Athletic Society Authority, respected chairperson, my respected colleagues, all the faculty members, the scholars. Today I will tell you on the post colonial new biological anthropology, uh, especially with focus in India. So now the time and space conflict, all of you, all these are the two best pillars, time and space in biological anthropology, especially. It is very important. To give the deep look possibility of time, I will touch the, uh, the areas what we are touching, we are working in our lab, in our, I belong to a 100 years old department, Department of Anthropology, University of Calcutta. So, the, the, what are the characteristics, characteristics of biological anthropology? There is a post colonial, that is, it is very much interdisciplinary in nature and it is very difficult to differentiate with the other biological sciences and we are borrowing, we are amalgamating, that's it process of amalgamation it is the main characteristics after the post-colonial time. So the focus areas, it is a very complex network system especially belongs to the biological anthropology. It is the international development in biological anthropology process of direct change that focuses on improving the welfare of people. It is a main focus area in so-called underdeveloped countries often though promoting economic growth. It is another focus area and we are focusing on human development. So biological anthropology might be the silent factor between all this. It might be a bridge. Very good. So the mechanisms of change, how the events and the creation of something new, always are thinking the primary area is discovery of new principles and the secondary is applications of principle after associated with rapid changes because our focus area is human. So not the animal. So we are this it's very difficult to use the term, the model, the samples, so we honor the participants. Always we have to depend on the volunteers. So the modernization, a model of change based on the belief or inevitable advance of science, Western secularism and process including industrial growth, consideration and stature and bureaucratization is another important area, the market economy. So what are the research areas, what are the focus areas? It is now the impost for your period. It is determined by the bureaucrats. It is determined by the corporates. So it is another very important, very trust area. It is a very pressure to the biological anthropologists. So the technological innovations, the illiteracy and the social mobility is the another focus area. The development of new methodologies by ethic and any point of view. And very big debatable question is globalization in biological anthropology, especially in, the, in India. So what are the changes? The few changes are the intentional or accidental. Few are the forward and the backward. We accept the backward model now and rapid or gradual and obvious that is nearly visible. For very good example, that is the corona. It is, it is the accidental. So, a very important uh, example is nearly visible, it is the artificial intelligence. It is nearly visible, we can't avoid, we have to accept, we have to develop the biological anthropology model according to. So, traditional development anthropology, now we are the critical development anthropology. We are fulfilling the needs of the society, we are fulfilling the needs of the time. It's a pressure, it's a way, that is a path making, this is the cutting edge now. So sustainable development, it must be sustainable. So the development that are not environmentally destructive and are financially supportable by the host 
and or environmentally by the earth as well. So we have to consider the human, we have to consider the environment and also the our surrounding. So biology is the internal phenomenon and our structure is our, uh, the vehicle is the external component, is the cultural anthropology and society is the reference form which we are active. So all these are, have strong bondage. So anthropometry have started. Nowadays we are the using anthropometry in the industrial design. The very important is the agronomics. Good evening. A respected chairperson of the session, Honorable General Secretary of the Scientific Society, Professor Rajendra Roy, uh, President of IUA President Asiatic Society, distinguished scholar, guest and colleagues. So when I was invited uh, in this session, I instantly I recapitulate those days when I was university, first year student and very first class of cultural anthropology one of my professor, Professor Samarandha Stada, he asked what is the purpose of yours studying anthropology in the University of Saga. And later he made us understand that studying of any subject is, should not be uh, by under compulsion, it should be by choice. And choice of selecting anthropology as a discipline for higher studies and researches that stands is validity globally and on the plane of human civilization. My experience in practicing or understanding being a student of anthropology, most of the time I spent in a very isolated place that we call the Angawa Nicobar Island uh, for 14 years, uh, 14 consecutive years. So when this topic is almost covering the entire part of the India, undivided India, now one part is almost left the Angawa Nicobar region and the very basic questions we have encountered those days those questions were also sustained in pre-colonial period, pre-independent period, and even today. The sets of questions are, who are they? Why they are different from us? How did they come to these islands? How old they are in these islands? Why they? are not being incorporated into the mainstream of Indian civilization. The sets of five questions are very basic to understand the attitude, mindset of the ruler, whether they are British colonizer, whether their ethnic identity is Japanese colonizer for four years, or whether the Indian colonizers in Andaman after independence. So, the beginnings, the genesis and development of exercising anthropology in Andaman start with the same track. This, I have, uh, we have constraints of time, only five, six minutes are there. I would like to refer some landmarks as the comments uh, historical documents. Uh, let's start with Marco Polo. In his description, he mentioned Angamania is a very large island. The people are without a king and are idolaters and no other than wild beasts. And I assume you all the men of this islands of Angamania have heads like dogs. They have a quantity of species as spices, but our most cruel generations and eat everybody that they catch, if not of their own race, they live on place and rice and meat and have fruits different from any of ours. 
it is marco polo's description let us translate it by uh, mr yul sir in yul in 1903 and the book was named the book of sir marco polo marco polo the venetian merchant of 13th century now come to or jump to 21st century so i will refer the name of the author later or uh, he one of the very uh, prominent uh, account uh, he devoted some portion or uh, subsection on the title manners manners of the unknown tribe but what he wrote there they with the bracket the unknown is men are gentle and pleasant to each other and kind of kind to children but having no legal or other restraint to their passion are easily roused to anger when they commit murder. They are certainly cruel and are jealous, precarious and vindictive. They have short memories of either good or evil, are quick tempered and have little or no idea of gratitude. They are affectionate to their wives and their most qualities are kept for strangers. I have often linked them to English country school boys of the laboring classes with the passion of mature savages. They are proud of having children and anxious to get them, but their passions are purely animal. I quoted the very uh, eminent works of Professor Ramesh Chandra Mujumdar. Name of the book was Penal Settlement in Andamans, published by the Government of India under the GPS series, and it was published on 15th of August 1957 by the Department of Culture, Ministry of Education those days and Social Welfare. So, the comments or the description of Marco Polo depends absolutely on the hearsay. However, the description and narratives of August Sangha Mojinda based on the art and data and some interactions. In between what happened in 1951, I just speak so many things. Uh, a letter I must read it there. Dr. V.S. Guho in 1946 he wrote a letter addressed to uh, Mr. R. N. Philip, who was the Under Secretary in the Ministry of uh, Home Affairs, the Government of India. It may be recalled that, in connection with certain proposals for ameliorations of the conditions of Aborigines of the Andaman and Nicobar Islands, this department was consulted by Mr. A. J. Stokes, Deputy Secretary to the Ministry of Home Affairs about the end of 1946 and in my OU noted dated 1st 11 January 1947 I suggested that a detailed anthropological survey of the islands would be necessary before any effective measures would be devised. The government of India accepted my recommendations for sending a oil equipped scientific party to the islands. So, in 1948, a team was sent under the leadership of Dr. B.S. Guho with young, enthusiastic, energetic anthropologist and they studied in detail uh, for a month, almost 45 days. The report they submitted, it absolutely impressed the Andaman Nicobar administration by the time and the one board administration left their control from colonial British colony to, and come to the Indian colony. And then, Anthropological Survey of India, and the one board regional, those days it was not the regional center, it was the subspecies. It was open. And Anthropology became very much integral part of tribal policies, not only the framing of the tribal policies as well as framing out any policies related to 
land and people of Mandavan. The journey continued. I am very fortunate that within this gallery, sir, I spent there a brief period and he had very first hand experience in those days. Jalabas was roaming around. The civic bodies were very much busy and engaged. Why they are roaming around? Why they should not be put into some jails? Or they should not be tamed? As British uh, uh, did with the Great Andaman, is put them into the Andaman home. And almost every alternative day, we had a very long discussion with other people of uh, uh, Andaman Nikmar administration. We had a consultation with the government mindset, rulers mindset, and what Professor Dundas have said, the Anthropolis must be poor people. And we own, we conquer against the attitude of the rulers, and we extend our hand to local government in framing tribal policies of Jarwa, tribal policies of Great Andamanis, policies of Hongpen, even post-tsunami rehabilitation policies in Andaman. Simultaneous, simultaneously, Anthropological Survey of India continued its own independent uh, kind of research journey for the last 60 years and it covers almost every aspect of anthropology, including physical anthropology, cultural anthropology, Priestly archaeology, uh, that uh, dating and uh, that archaeological science and the molecular anthropology. So, in two sense, what is the purpose of anthropology? That I realize every day of my staying in Andaman, that anthropology is a very subject which spear it for the welfare of the people. Thank you. A number of papers were presented covering the different issues, but it is very difficult to sum up all of them, all of them and highlight some of them. But most of them try to focus the contribution of anthropology in the development process and how to formulate proper strategy for the people, for the welfare of the people. And uh, including in context of and you see related to health and other issues, some of the points that we need to consider that uh, it is not really, illness is not really only because of lack of facilities or other issues. Sometimes some of the factors are which are responsible. It is for example in UNDP, I, I refer this uh, example in, in different places, when in the UNDP report shows that nearly 65% of the diseases in the third world country, countries could have been eliminated if we could provide just one thing, it is safe drinking water. Unfortunately, that is not happening to protect the interest of the business lobby and others. So, one will have to consider the these, some of these issues, uh, particularly the anthropologists on the basis of their first, uh, their field work, field study, they can identify some of these problems. Thank you so much and I am really grateful to Asiatic Society for the opportunity to chair this session and thank you, Shottu. Thank you, Professor Chaudhary. For accepting our invitation to chair this session, which is known as Round Table. And initially, he had a problem. He asked me, It is Round Table, where is the table round? The table turned out to be round in the sense that we have covered anthropological inputs starting from the evolution, going to the adaptation, finally reaching to the development and the encircling methodological issues that made it round. So we break 
for today meet tomorrow that is not tomorrow we are meeting at 10:30 uh in this very hall and we will pick up after lunch break and then heritage tour and tomorrow as i have already mentioned in the morning we the lakshmi puja uh, we are cultivating saraswati today today we will combine saraswati and lakshmi both otherwise we will be distressed so with this let us call it a day it closes for